Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the last Senate occasional lecture for the year. Um, I'm the clerk of the Senate, Rosemary Lang, for those of you who don't know me. And uh, in welcoming you, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay respects to all Indigenous elders, past and present. Well, we're going to finish the year with a big bang, a highlight, because it's um, a great pleasure today that I'm able to introduce to you Professor Ross Garno, AO. Uh, now, Professor Garno is so well known that anything I say about him will be superfluous, but if you mention China, well, that's synonymous with Professor Garno, who was ambassador to China in the 1980s. If you mention climate change, then of course we know that is synonymous with Professor Garno and his work in more recent times. Uh, he's a um, distinguished academic and author of, of many books. He's currently professorial research fellow in economics at the University of Melbourne. And uh, I think there are some of you here today who will have known him in a previous iteration as distinguished professor of economics at the Australian National University and a long-standing head of the Division of Economics in the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies. He has uh, so many degrees and honorary degrees that I'd take up the whole time probably going through them. But uh, it, it is a very, very great pleasure today to welcome Professor Garno. And uh, he's going to speak to us about global development, the long-term context of Australian development. Please welcome Professor Ross Garno. <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary. Yeah, very nice to be here in uh, the centre of Australian policy action these days. Um, ex excitement by the day uh, that uh, will, sh will shape our future. Um, I'm going to uh, say a few things about the current state of the Australian economy uh, and international dimensions of that, and th then I'm going to share with you some work in progress some things I'm thinking through on, on the uh, uh, big longer term developments in the global economy that will feed back strongly into Australian opportunities and challenges. Uh, but for the moment, uh, these are hard days for the majority of Australians who mainly depend on work for their livelihood. Um, Wednesday's national accounts tell us what analysts told us to expect. Uh, real income of Australians uh, has fallen for two quarters in succession. Our population growth makes that a large fall in average income. Uh, regrettably, there's much more of that to come. Uh, your real income may have increased if, you've, if you have many more assets and income from them than the Australian average. But for most Australians, employment and wages mainly determine the standard of living. Many others in small business have fared about as well as wage earners. The ratio of employment to population has sagged continuously since the China resources boom went into retreat in the second quarter of 2011. Real wages have fallen over the past year. Uh, it's worse if you are young, uh, youth unemployment, has grown much more rapidly relative to total uh, uh, unemployment uh, than in earlier downtimes, downturns. Dog days indeed. The good news is that the exchange rate is again heading down and wages are not rising to compensate for the associated rise in domestic prices. After the mismanagement of the China resources boom from 2003, the average Australian standard of living has to fall if we are to restore full employment and share equitably the pain of the dog days. The fall in Australian living standards was rendered inevitable by how we managed the salad days. Inevitable, but let no one kid themselves that it is easy for the people most affected by it. A wise government led by a wise society will be thinking of how it could cushion the blow to ordinary Australians by ensuring that discretion favours equity whenever there is a choice between policies with different distributional consequences. We've had a big productivity growth problem since the early years of the century. 
Don't kid yourself by looking at labour productivity changes that are boosted by the huge investment levels of the resources boom. Capital has a cost. What matters most for sustainable increases in living standards is total factor productivity, and the latest numbers give us no reason for joy. It's not an easy matter to define the policies that can contribute to re-establishing substantial growth in total factor productivity. It is harder still to support to build support for productivity raising reform and to make it work in practice. I talked about candidates for reform in last year's book, Dog Days, Australia After the Boom. There are no quick fixes. Policies to lift total factor productivity have to be thought through carefully and implemented steadily over many years. We have a long-term budget problem, a big one. We should be making sure that we are not doing anything to make it worse that we are aware of how much ground we have to cover and planning and gradually putting in place the policies that will cover that ground. But the priority for the immediate future is to restore enough growth in economic activity to stop the deterioration in employment relative to population and to start the repair. Apart from its importance to the living standards of ordinary Australians, this will do more than anything else to improve budget outcomes in the next couple of years. It will also help to re-establish a political basis for productivity raising reform. The centrepiece of a program to restore sustainable growth in employment is a big real exchange rate depreciation. A big fall in the nominal rate without the price effects of depreciation being passed through into wages. Avoiding wage increases in these circumstances is important enough to make the Senate discussion of defence force pay and conditions a factor in the battle for restoration of full employment. Jackie Lambie has full employment in her hands. Uh, more than half a century ago, my athletics coach at Perth Modern School, Jerry Hare, used to teach me that time wasted over each hurdle was time wasted in the race. We have wasted a couple of years above the exchange rate hurdle. We now have to get the front foot on the ground quickly so we can start running towards the next hurdle. It is nearly two years since I first put a number on the amount of real depreciation that was necessary for us to return to sustainable growth in employment. I said 20 to 40% from the dollar 105 at the time. 20% would be 84 cents. We reached that number just minutes after the ABS released the national accounts on Wednesday and returned there yesterday. That's good news. The middle of my range was 73 and a half cents, and the most that might be required was 63 cents as the fall in our dollar. Uh, excellent modelling by Janine Dixon and her colleagues in the Centre of Policy Studies at Victoria University for the Melbourne Economic Forum in July, suggests that the middle of the dog days range is the real depreciation that we, will, that we will need to restore full employment sustainably. With the depreciation of the yen, the won, and other and resource currencies against the dollar, the time wasted above the hurdle, and the limited response so far of investment in the trade exposed industries, the middle of the range now may not turn out to be low enough. Let's not waste any more time floating over the exchange rate hurdle. Let's decide to deal with any concerns about a housing bubble in the right way, with housing measures. First of all, the removal of the irresponsibly low risk weightings for housing lending in assessments of the bank's capital adequacy. That will free the Reserve Bank to set official cash rates according to the needs of the economy as a whole, rather than the risks of housing. That means moving cash rates down towards the lower levels currently in developed economies in the Northern Hemisphere. That's what will bring the exchange rate down. Let me say one more thing about uh, my old sportsmaster, Mr Hare. Lest the modesty of my own achievements on the track encourage doubts about his authority. Uh, Jerry Hare had also been the coach of Chilla Porter whose legendary struggle with, the, with American world record holder Charles Jumar in the high jump at the Melbourne Olympics kept us glued to our radios late into the Perth afternoon as the evening shadows dimmed to night at the MCG before the lights.
I, the, most of you here are about my age, uh, so you'll remember how the previous Olympic record was equaled or broken 10 times before Jumar uh, climbed half an inch higher to victory. Chiller's son, Christian, is a member of this parliament and can share more of the story with you. So when you hear Mr Hare telling you not to waste time over the hurdles, you'd better take note of his advice. I thought I would get the dog days out of the way at the beginning so I could spend most of the lecture on longer term global development issues with some reference to how these affect Australia. The rest of the lecture will focus especially on one big question of global development and its effects on Australia, how global savings have been tending to exceed global investment in the 21st century, how this has led to unprecedentedly low real interest rates for long-term debt, and how new approaches in the developed countries to public investment at home and abroad are necessary sustainably to secure full employment in the developed countries. Judicious developed country investment in income earning infrastructure in the developing countries can accelerate growth in the latter at a crucial time. I find it useful to uh, uh, think of uh, the world economy as having three parts. Obviously every country and every part of every country is unique, but uh, um, we've got to uh, think in broader categories if we're to speak of the world as a whole. So I, I find it useful to think about developed countries, developing countries and underdeveloped countries. Uh, the developed countries are uh, those uh, like us, so which enjoy uh, the high living standards that uh, come from uh, f full absorption of the beneficent effects of modern economic growth. Uh, the ordinary people in all of the developed countries uh, have standards of living, of consumption, of material comfort uh, beyond those of elites of any earlier generation of humanity. Um, for all of our problems, uh, it's uh, uh, in the developed countries of 2014 is a good place to be. Then there are the developing countries, which are most of the world's people, uh, which have put their foot on the escalator of modern economic development, are moving towards the income levels and material standards of living of the developed countries, but at varying rates. Um, uh, most that get on that escalator on average keep moving, but at different paces and with bumps in the road. Uh, with uh, quite a lot of thought being given to uh, what will determine whether uh, they eventually get there. And then there are the underdeveloped countries which have not succeeded in, in uh, putting their foot on that escalator. Uh, the developing countries uh, are experiencing growth in living standards of, at varying rates, but usually at considerable rates and on average uh, much faster than uh, the rate of increase in living standards in the developed countries. In the underdeveloped countries, uh, there's, on average, there's no growth in living standards at all. Here we're talking about around, around about a billion people of the seven billion uh, members of uh, humanity. Uh, and I have found very useful and interesting uh, uh, Paul Collier's book, The Bottom Billion, uh, talking about the phenomenon of the underdeveloped countries. Um, most of those uh, are in Africa. Uh, some are in our immediate region. I'll, I'll come back to that. I see the only stable endpoint of global development uh, as, uh, as being the whole of humanity joining in the uh, high standards of living uh, that uh, people in the developed countries currently enjoy. Obviously, there have to be major modifications of that or the pressures on resources uh, would uh, destabilise everything, um, and not least through uh, anthropogenic uh, climate change. Uh, but uh, all of the technical um, means are available to reconcile one day all of humanity 
having the standards of living that we enjoy uh, without um, uh, destabilizing uh, fundamentally important uh, dimensions of the natural environment. It will be a standard of living with different components, obviously uh, less, much less uh, consumption of fossil fuels, at least uh, without major measures being taken uh, to uh, abate their, uh, uh, their environmental consequences. Um, uh, uh, th there will be different patterns of consumption, but everything we know about uh, development and about uh, the way that uh, 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 humans can, can uh, gain um, satisfaction from modern uh, invention uh, tells us that uh, um, uh, that uh, the, the, what I call the maturation of economic development is not impossible. Not only is it not impossible, I think it's the only uh, stable endpoint of modern economic development. Uh, well, for the developed countries, uh, uh, while our material standard of living is high compared with uh, earlier generations of our species, where we nevertheless are facing challenges of a kind that, uh, that uh, most people in developing countries haven't faced for a very long time. Uh, we've seen in virtually all the developing, developing, developed countries stagnation in living standards since the great crash of 2008. And everywhere, there's still an expectation of each generation living better than generations before, created in earlier eras of uh, e economic development. Uh, so uh, the stagnation in living standards uh, is um, the, the source of some disappointment and tension. Uh, in all the developed countries, there's been a marked uh, slowdown to very low levels in productivity growth. Uh, since 2000. Uh, in the most advanced countries, uh, productivity growth since 2000 is proceeding less rapidly uh, than at any time at the frontiers in the leading countries uh, uh, since the early days of modern economic development a, a quarter of a millennium ago. This has been the subject of some discussion in the economic literature, uh, famous uh, a paper uh, uh, by Gordon, um, published by the National Bureau of Economic Research in the United States, uh, just uh, put forward the, uh, the, the data uh, and, uh, and some uh, hypotheses that, in his view, suggested uh, uh, we may not see again the, the rises in productivity and therefore of living standards that we had seen in earlier periods of modern economic development. It's, a, it's worse than that for ordinary people in many developed countries. In the United States, uh, uh, living standards of, of uh, people of the median, in the middle of the distribution, uh, have, are actually lower now than they were three decades ago. Uh, and uh, I, um, it's not quite so stark in Japan and Europe, but uh, it's heading in that direction. And in Australia uh, and in uh, 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 other uh, English-speaking countries plus Spain, the consequences of low productivity growth since the turn of the century were masked for a while by an extraordinary housing and consumption boom from the turn of the century to the great crash of 2008 unsustainable, funded by our banks borrowing abroad in wholesale markets, had to come to an end. Well, it did come to an end uh, in cataclysm in other developed countries. Uh, it didn't in Australia. Partly uh, a result of uh, quick-footed policy here, uh, but that policy was only viable uh, because of the, our special fortune uh, in being beneficiaries of an extraordinary China resources boom, uh, the strongest period of growth in over a long period in any country ever, uh, in a country that happened to be the world's most populous country, uh, and the most uh, energy and metals intensive growth that any country's ever had uh, at a uh, 
uh, it, which, which meant that uh, it, it spun off growth in demand for those commodities in which Australia was especially well placed to supply. So that postponed uh, the effects of uh, declining productivity on the Australian community until all those changes in China changed again. Uh, and one can date that change from the September quarter of 2011. And the change wasn't so much a reduction in the Chinese rate of growth. Uh, there, there has been a reduction of a couple of percent in the average rate of growth in China since then. But much more importantly, there was a change in the nature of Chinese growth. Uh, from 2000 to 2011, Chinese growth was uh, more investment intensive, more energy and metals intensive than growth anywhere has ever been. It was part of a brilliantly successful growth strategy that turned China into a great economic power and uh, raised average living standards of uh, most of its people by large amounts. But it had uh, adverse consequences to which there were political uh, reactions uh, and which uh, led to a reshaping of priorities. One consequence was the old pattern of growth was associated with rapidly wide widening inequality in the distribution of income. Um, Chinese government by 2011 had decided that that needed to be corrected. The old pattern of growth had to be modified. And the old pattern of growth was very damaging to uh, environmental amenity and stability, both within China uh, and in the, in the world as a whole. Uh, and so uh, local and environment and, and local and global environmental amenity uh, became an important uh, objective of Chinese policy. Chinese economy is a big ship. It takes a long time to turn around. You see discussion of, of new policies going back uh, as early as 2006. Um, the, the new approach was embodied in the 12 five-year plan from 2011 to uh, 2015. Uh, and um, during that, uh, uh, that period, you, you, uh, we've seen uh, more and more policies to put in place to uh, uh, reflect the new priorities in China. Uh, with each passing year, these new policies have stronger effects, uh, and uh, the, these uh, effects have, uh, have been apparent in the statistics on Chinese development since about 2012. And that has uh, broadly the, the changes that the Chinese government wants in the pattern of growth uh, are being implemented successfully. It's very hard. There's resistance politically from parts of the Chinese polity. Some things uh, can and will go wrong because you can't make change on that scale without taking risks with uh, economic stability. But so far, you'd have to say the, the, the changes are in, in the direction the, the government is seeking. One consequence is that what had been extraordinarily rapid growth in uh, uh, in uh, Chinese demand for metals and energy uh, uh, turned into quite moderate uh, growth in demand from 2011, especially from 2012. Uh, in fact, for the, the two, two central commodities in our resources boom, coal and uh, iron ore, uh, there's now very little growth at all. And looking into the future, there may be relatively little growth. So, so Australia had a big cushion uh, against the, uh, uh, some of the challenges that were facing other developed countries, but that cushion has been pulled away uh, in the last few years, still being pulled away, uh, and um, we're going to take a while in getting used to the consequences and managing the consequences uh, of all of that. Um, well, the, I, I see that as an underlying problem of the developed countries, challenge of the developing countries, a, a, a marked slowing of, uh, um, uh, of productivity growth, which means we can't rely on uh, average uh, um, in incomes rising in the future as they have for many generations. Uh, but there are other changes going on that are also putting stress on the developed countries. 
for productivity, uh, the things that we don't understand about where it's likely to go next. There's even a question of whether we properly can measure productivity because uh, in some areas of, uh, uh, of our life we, we've had new commodities and new services uh, that uh, greatly improve the quality of life, but the, those qualitative factors aren't properly represented in the statistics. But uh, nevertheless, measured well or not, the reality of uh, uh, low, and in the case of Australia since uh, 2005, negative productivity growth, the traditional time, kind, means that there's uh, much less incentive for investment, business investment in activities of the traditional kind, uh, giving employment of the, the uh, traditional kind. Levels of business investment have been low this century and especially since the great crash of 2008 in all of the developed countries. Amongst the other challenges, uh, a, a common theme across all the developed countries is the consequence of ageing, uh, people living longer and having less children. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, average age of uh, population growing very rapidly. Uh, in, the f in the early years, and this looks like it's going to be a long period in most countries, uh, that leads to increases in the savings rates as people prepare uh, for uh, longer uh, retirements. Uh, and so we've got lower incentives to, for business to invest, lower investment at the same time as we've got higher savings. And since the great crash of 2008, uh, we've seen uh, uh, both uh, household and government tendencies uh, to save more. Uh, in the case of governments, there's been fairly general wish to consolidate budgets, to reduce deficits, uh, because in response to the increased indebtedness uh, that was incurred during the financial crisis. Uh, in the case of uh, private uh, households and businesses, there, there's been a tendency to want to reduce debt um, for precautionary reasons uh, after the disruption uh, of, uh, uh, of 2008. Combination of all of these things uh, is leading to substantially higher levels of savings, uh, substantially lower levels of business investment. Uh, and uh, uh, that means uh, a tendency towards uh, uh, reduced demand in all of our economies, higher unemployment, lower economic growth. And uh, so that's a common story across the developed countries. The, the consequence of ageing are not as severe in those countries which have high levels of immigration, and Australia is one of those. In fact, Australia is uh, in the front of the developed countries uh, for that, but uh, these factors are important even in those countries. One consequence of higher savings and lower investment in the developed countries as a whole uh, is tendencies to lower interest rates. Uh, and uh, it's a bit of a tendency after the global financial crisis to see a period of very low interest rates as simply being uh, part of the process of recovery from the financial crisis, uh, to see uh, the central bank interventions keeping cash rates low, short-term interest rates low, and in the case of various times, Britain, Europe, Japan, and the United States, uh, a, a new phenomenon called quantitative easing, where central banks are, are exchanging uh, um, um, uh, effectively cash assets that can be turned into cash by, as they buy back uh, government bonds from the private sector putting more money into the uh, community so that's, and uh, with, with, the, with a view to reducing interest rates and uh, encouraging business activity. Um, there's been a tendency to see low interest rates uh, over the last half dozen years as, m as being significantly a response to the, the crisis and, the, and to the policy response to the crisis. But I think there's fair bit of evidence that more than that is happening, that we're entering a world in which uh, long-term interest rates uh, are much uh, 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 
uh, are much lower on an ongoing basis than they used to be. Um, the, the most common uh, long-term government security in most countries is a 10-year bond, uh, and the, the interest rates on the 10-year bond uh, is, uh, are lower in real terms uh, than they've ever been uh, in almost all of the developed countries. Uh, uh, last night, 2.23% uh, in the US, 1.99% in the UK, 0.77% in Germany, 0.44% uh, in, uh, in Japan, and this morning in Melbourne, 3.01% uh, in Australia. That's what the private sector is prepared to lend to government on a 10-year basis for, and in some of these cases, these are negative rates in real terms. We haven't been in this territory before. But we were actually getting into it before the financial crisis. Uh, and um, uh, uh, amongst the evidence for that, you might remember uh, the uh, celebrated, now discredited uh, governor of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, uh, talking about a decade ago about the conundrum uh, that the uh, um, Reserve Bank trying to raise interest rates by raising the cash rate uh, and finding that long-term interest rates didn't, didn't move at all or actually fell. I think we can now interpret that as an early sign of this new world in which the weight of savings in excess of investment was depressing long-term interest rates. Uh, and uh, uh, recently we've had the United States Federal Reserve withdrawing quantitative easing, withdrawing the unusual monetary policies of buying up uh, government bonds, but uh, long-term interest rates have actually fallen since they stopped quantitative easing. So we're in a new world uh, of, uh, I think, for a long time, if not permanently, uh, much lower long-term interest rates. Now, being in this world has a lot of consequences. One is a very fundamental consequence for uh, the distribution of income within societies. Uh, some of you may have read the celebrated recent book by uh, the French economist Piketty, Thomas Piketty, uh, Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, uh, it's been the best-selling economics book uh, of our time, if you take the first couple of years after publication, it's, I think, the best-selling economics book ever. Not many people read, bought and read The Wealth of Nations in the first few years. Uh, 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 and uh, he argues that uh, we're, we're in for a world in future of widening and widening uh, inequality and in income distribution because uh, uh, we're going to have uh, a rate of interest above the rate of growth uh, that those who already have capital will be accumulating it at that high rate. Uh, he notes a lot of historical data that shows that there's uh, uh, been a tendency for um, rates of return on low-risk investment like government bonds or, uh, uh, or land to be around 4 to 5 per cent in real terms after inflation. Uh, right back to the 18th century, and he, he quotes extracts from Balzac and uh, Jane Austen uh, to, to, to show their principal characters talking about the, uh, the, the, the wealth that the man you marry will have to have if, uh, uh, if you're going to uh, live in the style uh, uh, a gentle woman wants to live in, and that's all premised on long bond rates or, or yields on uh, land assets are around four or five percent in real terms. And Piketty says that will stay there like that uh, forever and therefore we're entering a period, and he talks about structural reasons, uh, why this will be the case, why inequality will grow wider and wider, that we'll be back to the inequality of the belle epoque in Europe. Uh, well, uh, um, that's a very different perspective from that of a number of other economists, uh, uh, the greatest public intellectual of the 20, 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, uh, wrote a couple of uh, um, important things in the 30s that talked about this issue, what will happen uh, to the rate of return on investment 
uh, into the long-term future. Uh, and uh, Keynes did this in two places, one an essay uh, in, in his uh, lovely uh, collection of essays, uh, Essays in Persuasion, and then in the last chapter, chapter 24 of his main book, The General Theory, he comes back to these themes. And uh, he talks about uh, um, modern economic development being so productive and uh, the, talks about there being a productivity growth for a long time, sees quite a lot of uh, um, income being saved, especially, especially by current owners of capital. Uh, so he says that so long as we don't make a mess of it with war, well, there was a war just a decade after he wrote it, but big one, uh, but as long as we don't make a mess of it with, uh, with, with, with war or uh, unnecessary depressions, and he, he wrote a book about how, how we could stop having them, uh, then uh, the long-term future for the global economy is one in which uh, capital is abundant. Uh, the rate of return will fall to very low levels. Uh, that there'll be no special advantages in income for those who have a lot of capital. Uh, for those who are interested in the important things of life, and I'm sure, and uh, he would have had in mind uh, the London Opera uh, uh, and French Champagne. Uh, that there will be uh, 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 an abundance uh, so that questions of, in, of inequality won't matter uh, very much. Uh, he talked about the euthanasia of the rentier, uh, the person who earns income from simply from ownership of capital, uh, ending up uh, not uh, having a, a substantial income. And the world he points to is almost the opposite of the world that Piketty uh, anticipates uh, in, in his celebrated book. Uh, well, look at the data in the last decade and it, it, start, it looks a little bit as if uh, Keynes was right. Well, well, that's only a bit of the story. Keynes had some weaknesses in his view of the world, but the big one was that in his world, uh, they, uh, uh, um, his world was the world of, uh, if not England, of the developed countries. Little for some purposes, uh, the empire, but not, not much that. Uh, even his interest in continental Europe was uh, constrained, Hayek once, uh, uh, criticised him for not being interested in anything that wasn't published in in England. But certainly Keynes didn't see a world in which uh, China and Indonesia and India uh, would be enjoying the uh, living standards of the developed countries. If he had, then he wouldn't be talking, wouldn't have, well, he, he would have had to have wondered about whether this huge abundance of capital would come for the world as a whole uh, so early. That, that was a a gap in his thinking. Well, uh, uh, a little bit, that's the challenges of the, the economic challenges of the developed world. A, a little bit about the developing countries. I, I've talked a lot about China already, and I think that for the purposes we're talking about, uh, we should think of China uh, as a developed country. I think it will be in the range of incomes of de developed countries within a decade. It's got the savings, uh, a tendency towards savings over investment like the developed countries. In all of the developed countries and including China in that category, to maintain full employment and economic growth in the period ahead, you're going to need uh, a lot more uh, investment uh, in, uh, uh, in which, uh, or promoted by uh, uh, the public sector. Uh, in some countries there will be opportunities for that to be an infrastructure uh, but uh, in many countries, uh, uh, we will have to see large-scale investment in income-earning assets in the developing countries uh, if, we're, if we're going to uh, uh, see significant yields on, on investment. And that will be helpful to maintaining employment uh, and economic growth in the developed countries. In, if this starts to happen, uh, we will see um, the tendency towards net exports exceeding imports in the, the developed countries, capital outflow uh, into uh, uh, income earning development activities in developing countries, uh, and uh, uh, um, 
and uh, greater activity for employment in the export industries in the developed countries. I think that's a way the developed world uh, will need to shift for its own regions and it will be highly advantageous for the developing countries. And there will be opportunities in the developing countries because the well, the, those developing countries that have uh, put their foot on the escalator of modern economic growth, the big ones, India and Indonesia, but lots of others, uh, have the capacity to absorb a lot of that sort of capital. So a bigger challenge in the underdeveloped countries, uh, roughly corresponding to uh, Collier's bottom billion, and today the bottom billion include all of Australia's island neighbours in an arc of instability, intensifying poverty and high fertility and population growth, uh, at least through Papua New Guinea to Fiji. Collier didn't include Papua New Guinea and his bottom billion in 2007, and the persistence then of the struggle for good governance within the leadership justified his hesitation at that time. Regrettably, there is a Gresham's law of corruption in a country with weak institutions. When the currency has been debased, bad money drives out good. The good is forced out of circulation until there has been transformational institutional change. Debasement occurred in Papua New Guinea this year with the serial dismissal of the anti-corruption commissioner and two successive police commissioners for seeking to take action against what they judged to be prime ministerial breaches of the law. When the head of government is above the law, there is no rule of law. The struggle is now over for the time being in Papua New Guinea and the country's categorisation as part of the bottom billion is unambiguous. My observations from experience of development in the island countries of the Southwest Pacific correspond to those of Collier in Africa and support his main conclusions. Underdevelopment has its origins in problems of governance which are far-reaching and intractable. Making headway on the problems of governance sets a path to development, but it's hard to get started. Democracy is often an illusion until institutional weaknesses have been removed by education and drawing on external institutions. The exploitation of valuable natural resources can temporarily create the statistical illusion of development, but is usually associated with kleptocratic corrosion of established institutional strengths. The magnitude of the challenge does not mean that progress is impossible, just difficult. Requiring institutional stability, wisely directed institution building over long periods, and often intrusive external support. A number of bottom billion African countries are making headway in the 21st century so far, led by Ethiopia with large Chinese support for infrastructure and agricultural and industrial development. The bottom billion are, much, are more important than their current numbers suggest, because much higher fertility makes them a rapidly increasing proportion of humanity. We could be confident that the global population will be on a downward path within a few decades, despite increasing longevity, with all of its benefits, if and only if a large proportion of the bottom billion were headed towards entry into the ranks of the developing countries. International support for development in the bottom billion must take the form of transfers rather than income earning investments and be justified on development and security grounds. It can contribute to lower real exchange rates and net exports and therefore on employment in the developed countries, but not to future income for an older population in the developed countries. So uh, whether we're successful in the maturation of global economic development, uh, with all the benefits that come from that, uh, really depends on the, not only on the continued success of the developing countries, but uh, in getting onto the economic development escalator, the, uh, the people of the underdeveloped countries. That's a hard task and failing that, we can't even be certain that the proportion of people on earth enjoying high living standards uh, will increase uh, over time, even if countries like China and Indonesia and India uh, are growing very strongly. Uh, there is a danger that a failure of development in the bottom billion uh, will catch humanity uh, in a Malthusian bog. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Professor Garno. No wonder they call it the dismal science. Uh, if, if anyone has a question or a comment, uh, I'd invite you to come to one of the microphones. There's a, a microphone upstairs in the um, gallery as well as two down here. Um, While we're waiting for the first question, can I just respond on the dismal science? All, all right. <laughs> Our profession was given that name by the historian Carlyle because the classical economists were dead set against slavery. Uh, they thought it was a terrible institution uh, that, that uh, defied all of the premises upon which they did their work. Carlyle was a defender of, the, of established institutions of which slavery was venerable and uh, had widespread support. Uh, economists were dismal because they said that that venerable institution had to go. Ah, I stand chastened. <laughs> it, it's a very depressing picture you paint of the developing world on our, or the uh, doorstep. Um, and from a parliamentary point of view, I know that a great deal of work is being done by this parliament and, and Australasian parliaments uh, generally in capacity building in our southwest Pacific neighbours to try to um, help create the institutions that will strengthen governance and, and accountability in, in those societies. But, um, I know this is a very broad question. Um, a, a successful economy doesn't have to have a, 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 its base in democratic institutions, does it? Do, do you care to comment on that thesis? Yeah, well, that's true, it doesn't. And of course, China is the exemplar of that point. Mm. Um, uh, we don't know if we can have a successful developed country without democracy. We will learn that over the next decade or so in China. Mm. Uh, the Chinese leadership uh, under the General Secretary of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping, is setting out to improve the Communist Party, uh, to constrain corruption, uh, which, is, which is seen by the Communist Party leadership as uh, undermining support and legitimacy making it more efficient and effective. And I think the model that he's got in mind is the model of the platonic guardian. Mm. Uh, now, Karl Popper, in his great book, uh, The Open Society and Its Enemies, identified um, Plato as the source of, uh, of enmity to the open society. Uh, he, we contrasted the Platonic view of the world with uh, with with the democratic mm. open society, mm. uh, um, where you had government by uh, an elite. In Plato, with his uh, aristocratic background, would have had in mind an aristocratic elite uh, that uh, had the interests of the community at large and governed. Uh, benevolently in the interests of the community at large. Well, I think that uh, Xi Jinping was seeking to build a communist party around that, that uh, ideal mm -hmm. of autocratic government. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we don't know if that will be successful. If it is successful, it will be a very big challenge uh, to um, democracies which are going through problems of political culture. Uh, in China and in Australia, uh, we both face uh, problems of maintaining integrity in government, uh, maintaining public purpose in policy making against the pressures of private interests as private interests become less constrained in the pressure that they apply uh, to public policy making. Uh, you see in our current Senate uh, manifestations of those pressures of a kind, I think that when we think about it, we thought we'd never see. Uh, 
uh, and uh, in recent times uh, we've seen um, an influence of vested interests in the policy making process that certainly uh, is uh, larger, less constrained, more effective, at least than than in the late periods of the 20th century where uh, public policy and the public interest uh, seem to be more firmly established. So uh, if uh, Xi Jinping succeeds, uh, uh, not in our type of society, uh, even if it is corrupted, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, there will be deep commitment to our democratic institutions in our society, but in other societies that are still making up their minds uh, about political systems, then uh, um, a successful China will not look so bad uh, 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 against mm -hmm. uh, um, corrupt democracies. Now, I think we can do much better than that. Uh, and uh, I think it's the responsibility of all of us to make sure we do much better than that. And I don't think that Xi Jinping's challenge is an easier one. He may very well fail. We, don't, we just don't know if you can have uh, 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 an autocratic um, developed market economy as he is seeking to build, but that's very important. Now, I, I think when you're talking about the pessimism, you, you were thinking about the, the small countries of the Southwest Pacific. Uh, I can't see any system of government that is more certain to work in the interests of broadly based development than a democratic one in the Southwest Pacific. One can dream uh, of... Uh, a Leninist state emerging and, and sponsoring effective development like in Ethiopia. Uh, one can dream of uh, an efficient, well, more or less efficient uh, military government uh, uh, along the lines of the Suharto regime uh, in the period leading up to Indonesian uh, democracy. But I think these are foolish dreams in the Southwest. Pacific. I think that the, for, for all of their weaknesses, uh, the challenge is to make current institutions work. Uh, but let's recognise that current institutions are not working, uh, that there are profound problems uh, that we Australians have stood by and watched with, with little demur the disintegration of the rule of law in Papua New Guinea this year. Uh, so uh, I think that's a problem for all of us. Thank you. Now up in the gallery, we have a questioner. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, um, thank you. So uh, my question is, you referred uh, in your speech to the housing bubble. Um, in terms of uh, this problem, do you perceive it to be something that regulators should be interested in because it uh, detracts from productive investment or because it cre or because a correction will create volatility and um, whether you think we've got to the point where it's a it's a lean or clean decision um, and lastly whether you think the macro prudential regulation uh, we've seen in New Zealand is suitable for Australia. Thank you. Uh, my view of the housing problem is a very simple one. The economy as a whole needs lower interest rates, which will bring about a lower exchange rate. Some people say, and some readings of what the Reserve Bank has said, suggest that they think uh, that the constraint on lowering interest rates is that we've got a bubble in the housing market. I'm not so sure, but I sure don't want worries about a bubble in the housing market to stop us from lowering interest rates when the rest of the economy needs it. Uh, so if there's a housing problem, deal with it in the right way with a housing solution and a form of macro prudential uh, management of the uh, housing sector is the right way of dealing with it. Uh, my first priority would be normalisation of the extraordinary uh, 
arrangements we have for uh, risk weighting uh, for capital adequacy purposes of bank lending uh, for, for housing, uh, where uh, banks uh, um, really have a considerable discretion how they weight the risk of lending to housing, which means that you have much more highly leveraged lending to, uh, uh, for housing than for other activities. Uh, banks make a lot more money as return on investment out of lending to housing than, than to anything else for this reason, and so you, you get a, uh, an artificial focus of lending in that sector. So I'm all in favour of uh, cleaning up that weakness in our regulatory system, uh, which will free the Reserve Bank to reduce interest rates uh, and to uh, uh, thereby bring down the exchange rate so we can get over that hurdle, start employment growing again, uh, and then we can turn our minds to the harder and longer term issues uh, of productivity in the budget. Yes, sir. Staying on housing, the Chinese problem about the vacancy rates in building and housing, what's the, going to happen there? Uh, I, I don't know much more than, uh, the, the, than, the, uh, uh, anal than the analysts who follow those, those specific issues and write about them have been saying. Uh, I myself uh, don't see a likelihood of a major disruption of growth in China. Uh, the most important thing that, from Australia's point of view that's happening in China is the structural change, which is intended and which is working as intended, uh, which is reducing growth in demand uh, for, uh, uh, for iron ore, for coal, uh, for, for some of our other uh, um, energy and metals uh, uh, products. I think that that will be more, that, that planned structural change is of more fundamental importance than the problem in the housing market. Now, uh, uh, China is now, to a very large extent, a market economy, and market economies spring surprises. Uh, and it would be surprising if some of the surprises to Chinese development are not large now that it's a market economy. So this might be the first of the big ones, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but my basic judgment is that uh, it's, n it's not a fundamental threat uh, to uh, ongoing growth in the way the Chinese leadership wants it to unfold. We've got two more. So can I just ask you to step aside for a minute? I think the lady at the back was before you. And then we'll go to you. Just very quickly, following up from the G20 and particularly the finance minister's G20, well, I'm not sure if they're F20 or what, something called bail-in provisions. There seems to be some very low level chat going around and very bad press on the extension of something called bail-in provisions globally. Could you comment on that and, and is it something we ought to worry about? Well, I like bail-in provisions. <laughs> bail-in provisions are a way of ensuring that if banks run themselves imprudently and get themselves into deep trouble, and we have to bail them out, as we will, because it'll damage the rest of the economy if we don't, uh, that, they, that their shareholders pay a fair bit of it, rather than the rest of us. And naturally, uh, existing proprietors of banks uh, don't like the idea of, uh, um, uh, of they being the big losers uh, if they have to be bailed out with government guarantees or government uh, provision of capital. Uh, the, uh, and I, I think it's important to set out the rules for a bail-in well in advance of a crisis uh, so the managers of banks n and their shareholders know the consequences of uh, running too close to the wind. Uh, if we had that, we'd see less running close to the wind. It would be less likely uh, that, uh, the pri that a future Prime Minister will be called upon to do what Kevin Rudd was required to do one October afternoon in Canberra in 2008 and ex extend a blanket guarantee to all of the wholesale debt of all of our banks and put on the, uh, 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 the balance sheet of the Commonwealth of Australia $178 billion of contingent liabilities. We don't want that to happen again. It's less likely uh, if we have uh, careful plans set out in advance of the conditions under which 
uh, the Australian government will bail out the banks. Okay, last question. Uh, Ross, I'd like to draw you out a little bit more on the medium, longer term trajectory of growth in the Chinese economy, because it's obviously so important, as you said, to the global economic outlook, but particularly to the economic environment in which Australian policy will have to be made over the coming 5, 10, 15 years or so. Uh, the expectation uh, that I heard in your presentation uh, was for China transiting effectively to higher income levels, high income levels in the next decade or, or a bit more. Uh, but you raised some questions uh, in response to a question about uh, uh, the governance system that will make that effective. Uh, China's got a lot of problems, including the problem of growing rich, uh, before, uh, growing old before it's become rich. And we've seen that uh, advanced economies haven't been too successful in reforming the social and economic institutions to manage that problem. Uh, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you think China is going to affect that transition uh, into higher income levels over the next decade or so uh, and manage the sorts of problems implied in that aphorism. And maybe because that's too easy a question, you can tell me a little bit about what you think about where India is going to. <laughs> but, but we've only got time for just a little bit. <laughs> well... India first or I'll forget if I give a long answer to China. Uh, I think that, I, I think that um, modern economic growth internationally oriented is now pretty well established in India. Um, they've got the problems of a democratic polity, good problems to have, but they're real, large uh, problems of money and politics like we do, like the Indonesians do. Uh, and uh, that makes it difficult sometimes to introduce first best policies in the, in the public uh, interest. Uh, one consequence of having those policies now is that uh, there's not so much uncertainty about the political transition as there, as there is in, in China. But uh, uh, I, I think that uh, um, we're likely to see uh, a continuation of reasonably strong growth in India. The short-term challenges are very large. The, some of the um, external payments and uh, debt issues are quite public. Uh, debt issues are quite large. I think India could be helped a lot uh, by uh, large-scale investment in infrastructure from the developed countries and China. Uh, so I think the Indian Prime Minister is wise to be as positive as he is about China's. Uh, proposed Asia um, International Investment Bank, I think that that can make a very, that type of thing, that type of institution, that type of lending can make a very big difference to, to India. Uh, India needs a lot of international capital. It doesn't need a lot of short-term volatile capital. It needs long-term investment in things like uh, infrastructure. So that would reduce the risks. Uh, the cooperation between China and India on this question improves the chances that India will come smoothly through uh, the, the, the challenges ahead. Hard for India to grow as fast as China uh, uh, for a lot of reasons. A more, it's a very different society. Uh, you don't have the uh, capacity for central control. You might never have had it. Uh, the, the, the Qing emperor had a different kind of control to the Mughal uh, uh, emperor. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and tendencies in the Chinese society lend themselves more easily to very high rates of savings, which were the, the motor of that extraordinary period of growth in the first 11 years of this century. Uh, but nevertheless, there's a basis there for reasonably strong growth. So um, uh, on the, the China question, so yeah, China, uh, when you give a, uh, a brief discussion of China's long-term prospects, then it comes out uh, glibly, and I don't want to uh, uh, be glib about the, the, the challenges that China faces. But my, my feeling is that all of the purely economic problems uh, are, are uh, manageable and are more or less in hand. Uh, problem of, uh, of, of aging, uh, China's been 
making a big effort in recent years to put in place a, a, a broadly based social security uh, uh, program, including large transfers to uh, uh, to people in low income people in rural areas. Um, uh, where, uh, there's a very large problem of differential access to basic services uh, in different parts of the country, very strong urban bias. Uh, the current policies are putting quite a lot of effort into correcting that, uh, which is quite important for uh, the, the issues that you're raising. If those, pot if those changes work, those reforms, uh, you'll have some easing of the labour constraints um, um, with uh, people from rural areas able to, to work for longer in, in, in urban areas. Uh, I, I would see the biggest challenges to uh, China's uh, transition to being a developed country being the challenges of, of uh, managing the political uh, pressures that will be associated with continued rising incomes, internationalization of information. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we're in unknown territory I don't know uh, how big those, how manageable those challenges are going to be. Well, on that note, I have to sadly inform you that our time is up. I'd like to thank you, Professor Garno, for a tremendously learned and stimulating presentation today. You've given us all lots to think about. But as it's our last lecture for the year, I'd also like to thank our audience for coming and, and wish everybody a very happy Christmas. And we look forward to seeing you back here probably in February next year. But please join me in thanking Professor Garner for a wonderful lecture.